see glow. Why do fish sing? Why do fish sing? Well, if you were around in the 90s, you knew that Fish does sing because he used to play in a band called Marillion. And probably at the age of 75, he still does. I don't know. However, other astonishing insights into answers to those questions and the other facts from the ocean are in the latest new book called The Blue Wonder by Dr. Frauke Bagouche. And she's today's guest on Tree Lady Talks. To quote from her press release, it's an intimate account of the beauty and mystery of the ocean, including why, with every breath, we are inextricably linked to its blue wonder. Dr. Bagouche also works as a freelance lecturer and provides training on the subjects of plastic pollution in the oceans, the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems and the overfishing of the oceans. She speaks fluent English, which is just as well because Sharon knows four words in German and even though one of them is sex, actually it wouldn't have got her too far in this interview. Published by Greystone Books, there's a foreword by Jill Hynerth, it's translated by Jamie McIntosh and it's out now to coincide with National Marine Week, 25th of July to the 8th of August. So go out and get a copy, why don't you? Hello, this is Tree Lady Talks and I'm Sharon Durdent Hollenby. All music and production is by Noel Durdent Hollenby. And all views expressed by me or the interviewees are entirely personal. Welcome to Dr. Frauke. Thank you so much for joining us. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Well, I'm a marine biologist um, who lives in Germany, far away from the sea at the moment, which is a little bit odd. But um, I have uh, studied in Germany marine biology, and then later uh, it drew me to the sea. So I went to Egypt to work as a dive guide there. After that, I worked at universities in Vienna and in Paris on marine organisms. And then I came to my favorite country in the world. I lived in the UK for about three years, I guess. And I work at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton. And I really, really enjoyed that. It's such a great institute, great people from all around the world. Yeah, it's really great. I did my degree at the University of Southampton 100 years ago. It's, it's really, really good. I really enjoyed my time there and I wish I could have stayed, but I didn't get a job there. So I just got a job after Southampton at the, um, in the Maldives, actually. So I was a manager oh, of the eco center. That's not a bad swap, is it? Southampton no. for the Maldives. I don't think too many people would complain. No, I, I, d- I did not complain. No, it, it was lovely. And uh, there, you know, you just get there, you expect everything. You expect like blue water, crystal clear blue water, white sandy beaches, a tropical paradise. And so I thought, okay, right, I go there, I relax a little bit after the stressful time. What I discovered, there was a lot of plastic uh, garbage in the ocean, and that became... I wouldn't say my favorite topic, but my favorite hate topic. And that's what I do right now. After the Maldives, we set up a, a cruise, a private cruise with professional windsurfers, like an expedition to um, show the people, especially younger people, what the marine plastic pollution is like and how it looks in the ocean. So we sailed like, I think, it was nearly 5,000 miles, about 10 weeks. We crossed the Atlantic Ocean through the North Atlantic garbage patch. And we took a lot of plastic samples to see, uh, to, to have a look at the microplastic pollution in the ocean. It was really shocking. What can we do about it? Apart from on an individual level, using less plastic, what can governments do about it? Can it be cleaned up or is it too big a problem? Well, let's say, you know, there are initiatives who claim to clean the ocean. And it is nice that there are people who do an effort. Uh, However, you know, most of the plastic which enters our oceans will sink down and they are diverted by the ocean, uh, ocean currents. And most of the plastic is actually in the deep sea and we will never be able to get this plastic out and it will break down and eventually it will become microplastic and it will spread even more and pollute our oceans more. So what we have to do is we have to start on land. We have to start with politics. They have to put pressure on industries. So plastic um, 
um, gets developed as fully recyclable plastic. Most of the plastic we have right now is actually burned, incinerated. Mm. Some plastic is recycled and uh, a lot of plastic actually is shipped away from industrial countries to third world countries where mm. it enters our oceans again. Oh, dear. So it's, it's horrid. So it's that's, you know, why I devoted my life right now to that problem because yes. um, after that cruise, I came back uh, to Germany for a very short time. Then I went back to another island in the Maldives to work there, to manage another marine station there. And until, since then, I'm back in Germany and I have uh, founded an NGO. It's called The Blue Mind yes. together with a colleague. And what we do is we bring marine science in land and we want to ensure marine conservation and land because it has to start in land. We produce most of the CO2 here. We produce most of the plastic inland and people who live, uh, you know, not by the sea don't have the connection. Um, most of them don't. And that's what we try to establish the connection from us here in land from what we do, what we produce, what we consume um, to the sea and and we start in schools, basically, and that's what I do right now. Just getting to the root cause of the problem, but it is a worry. But let's talk about happy things for a while. The wonder, <laughs> the wonder, the blue wonder, which is the title of the book. Phytoplankton, what is it and why is it essential to the health of the planet? Actually, without phytoplankton, you and I wouldn't be able to take our next breath because phytoplankton are tiny algae in, in the ocean. So we have uh, not just algae in the ocean, which counts as plankton, but also the um, animal part. It's called zooplankton, which consists of larvae, of uh, jellyfish, everything that drifts, that's taken by the current and can't actively swim is called plankton. The vegetable part, the phytoplankton, produces more than 60% of our global oxygen supply which is amazing. So we actually, we depend on the ocean. People don't think about that because the, the common um, thought at the moment here in the UK and in the world is planting trees and obviously that's a great thing. But actually in terms of contribution, it really is the ocean, isn't it? The phytoplankton that's given us the air that we breathe. Well, planting trees is, is really good and we need to plant more trees for sure. But what we also have to do is we have to take care of our oceans because they are our lifeline. And if the oceans die or, you know, get polluted even more, uh, we are actually um, having trouble to breathe in the near future or in the far future, but in the future. Part of the beauty of the ocean, when people think about how, how wonderful it is, they think of coral reefs. So could you just get back to basics, really, and just describe what a coral reef is? And then you go on in the book to talk about mass weddings. Well, coral reefs are actually structured, made by tiny aquatic animals. They're called coral polyps. And they build their exoskeleton. So their skeleton is around their body tissues. Um, by um, participating calcium carbonate, which they take out from the ocean. And that's what we see. And we can even see coral reefs from space because they belong to the biggest structures made by, built by live animals on Earth. So the Great Barrier Reef is, I think, 1,500 miles long, and it can be seen from space. So it's absolutely amazing. And, you know, when you when you watch documentaries, you see a lot of corals looking very colorful, especially those in the Red Sea. And then you have cor corals which are not so colorful and they get their colors because they live like an um, it's called mutual symbiosis with tiny algae. And these algae have a very complicated name it's called Xug Santelle. And these algae, um, you know, the, the tiny coral polyps incorporate these algae into their body tissues. And that's the colors we see with the corals. So mostly they are brownish and greenish, but you also can see reddish and orange, beautiful corals. And describe the mass weddings when they, when they propagate. What happens then? So, well, it's called um, coral spawning. And uh, spawning occurs usually shortly after full moon and lasts a couple of days. Actually, at night, they spawn. So when you swim through spawning coral colonies, it's like snow underwater. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it really is. So they simultaneously 
the, the coral polyps simul simultaneously, sorry, <laughs> release. Yeah, simultaneously. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> release their eggs and sperm into the water where fertilization takes place. And then, you know, a tiny larvae develops and they settle down and they start to uh, participate calcium and build up these beautiful, beautiful coral colonies, which we can see and we refer to as coral reefs. How wonderful. What strikes me as amazing is the timing. The fact it's almost like they've had a secret meeting or they've um, been sending each other an email <laughs> under the sea that tonight's the night. Yes. Put on the romantic music and off they well, go. Yes, it's and incredible. it's still partly a secret, really. So, you know... Corals not just reproduce by, by spawning, they have different techniques, which is really amazing. Some actually um, produce asexual by fragmentation. So, you know, when a wave hits a coral reef, so sometimes coral break, and usually the corals then die, obviously they bleach, they, they die, but sometimes they are able then to cement themselves again on hard substrates. So they actually fragment and build up a new colony. Which is actually also very helpful if you want to rehabilitate a coral reef. Yes, because they are under threat, aren't they, with a lot of bleaching. So what are the main causes, in your opinion, of the bleaching of some coral reefs? Or is it very complex? Yeah, it, it is. But, I mean, you know, we have we have uh, different threats to coral reefs. Lots of it is tourism, of course. There's a lot of pressure. People walking on reefs, you know, they're just grabbing onto coral reefs. They use sunscreen, which is harmful to coral polyps. Then you have the intake of sewage. Uh, that also harms the corals, plastic pollution harms the corals, but by far the biggest, and also like fishery, but by far the biggest threat to corals is actually climate change. So global warming and uh, the simultaneously warming of the water and uh, the acidification of seawater. But there are some measures being taken to rehabilitate the corals, aren't there, in some areas with some success? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've uh, used a few of them myself uh, just to try to rehabilitate coral reefs in the Maldives as well as in Vietnam. And, you know, that's when you use these fragmentation techniques I spoke earlier about. Um, you take tiny fragments of corals um, with one technique, for example, they have to be alive, obviously. And then what you can do, some people um, use cable binders and, um, you know, bind them on ropes hanging in the water. So it's called a coral nursery. So what you do is basically very similar to what you do to forests. You know, you plant a tiny tree somewhere in a nursery and when it's big enough, you plant it somewhere else, maybe. Or, you know, that's what you do in the water as well. So you can plant entire coral nurseries and when they are big enough, you transport these tiny corals back into the reef and restock like broken parts of the reef. But we need it on a massive scale and we need to get to the root cause of the problem, of course, why they're under, under threat. Yes. Um, moving on from that, I was fascinated to hear about how noisy <laughs> it is under the sea and read about flatulent <laughs> herrings and roaring lionfish. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about the noises that you might hear when you're diving. Well, especially when you're on coral reefs, it's really, really noisy. It's not what you expect, you know. You, you dive down, you know, and what you would expect is like silence. Maybe a boat you can hear somewhere, but definitely no fish. But fish are everything but silent. They are quite chatty, actually. It's like some scientists compare them with birds on land because at dusk and dawn, it's getting really noisy in the reef. So you can hear chirping sounds, growling sounds, roaring sounds. And fish like the lionfish, they roar, for example, or the uh, batfish, they, you know, it's very monotonous. It's called, it's like ba, 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 ba. You, you can actually have a look at sound libraries, um, you know. Yeah, scientists record fish underwater and they have sound libraries and you just can have a look and sneak peek in. And, you know, maybe you can hear a, a, a bad fish talking to you. Well, we're going to do that. For this episode, we're going to start with the sounds of the sea. <laughs> Note to know. Oh. And, um, well, I learned a lot about fish in there. Well their sexuality really i mean how would you rewrite finding nemo i'm sure most listeners have heard, seen or heard of finding nemo the popular cartoon film tell me why it's so inaccurate well it is very inaccurate actually because like lots of reef fish and also other fish 
clownfish can change sex during their their lives. So when you dive down and you see an, an, an anemone with a pair of clownfish or a group of clownfish, just have a close look. You will see like a bi one big fish and one slightly smaller fish. The biggest fish in that anemone is a female. And the little smaller, a little bit smaller fish is the, uh, the male. And th both of them can mate. And then you see lots of tiny fish around them. These are the juveniles. And then imagine like the, the female dies. What happened in nature, but not at Disney, in a Disney movie, is that the next biggest fish will change its sex. It becomes, from, it be, it becomes a female. And wow. the next biggest fish in the hierarchy, hierarchy will just change its sex too and uh, change to um, a male which can reproduce. And if you would have a look at Nemo, uh, <laughs> It would be rated, rated like it would be censored, I guess. At you know. Yes, it would be. A, a, in the UK, we'd call it an 18 certificate. <laughs> this, this, yeah, this it would get definitely because when we have a look at Nemo's story, is like, uh, you know, they grew up together. His dad, because his mom uh, is killed by a barracuda, and so after Nemo comes home after some adventures, being kidnapped by divers for for the industry for the aquarium industry. So there would be just the two of them, the dad and Nemo. Dad would change its sex and become uh, a female, and mm -hmm. Nemo would mate with his now mother, oh, right. which has was his father <laughs> before. So you can't show that to children, obviously. No. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's fascinating. And another thing that really, for me, demonstrated the emotional intelligence of fish was the underwater hospitals. I had this image where you described the cleaner fish and the cleaner shrimps yes. touting for business. Describe the scene. The coral reef, you can compare it to a big city, a big buzzing city. And like every city, you need a health system there, a functioning health system. And the, like cleaner shrimp and cleaner fish are doctors and nurses underwater. So they're stationary. Like cleaner shrimp some species of cleaner shrimp rock, rock back and forth. They have a special dance and to show them that they are free. And um, fish or, 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 you know, like manta rays uh, or, or sea turtles or other fish, they will, you know, go to these cleaning stations, to these hospitals underwater and wait patiently for their turn. So wow. um, the cleaning shrimp will rock back and forth when they're really, really hungry. And when they have a patient, they will clean the patient. So what will they do is they, like, they, like, they eat the parasites from the fish skin, they clean the scales, they clean wounds. So that's really, really important underwater. The same with the cleaning fish. They are stationary too. And they live in harems, usually one male and um, like the I think blue or black striped cleaning rust is the name. They live in harems with lots of females, one male. And the male is in charge, obviously. And uh, some females are getting really, really excited um, for their next meal. And sometimes they bite their clients. And um, when the clients get bitten quite often in that same spot, in that same cleaning station, they don't go there anymore. And the male actually what it does when, you know, it's, it's been shown in experiments, right? It's, it's not my Im uh, imagination. <laughs> and when the male just realized that the female is over ambitious and hurts the client, he, he actually um, chases the female through the reef <laughs> as a punishment. Wow. <laughs> it's just amazing, isn't it? And it just shows it's so complex. It's such a sensitive ecosystem and they're so intelligent with, with personalities. Absolutely. They have fish have different personalities they're really yeah. funny and there's a really nice book it's called what a fish knows and this is about emotional intelligence of fish it's just beautiful many of us now are aware of just how sensitive and intelligent they are but i love the story of how a cuttlefish woos its mate well there's a cuttlefish species i think they're called morning cuttlefish uh, sepia plangon and they're really, really smart, especially the males. So what they do uh, is, you know, they want to woo uh, their female. And what they do is they strike and when they, they swim to the female. And when there is another male around, of course, which is maybe bigger and stronger than that male, they uh, use a very, very special technique. So they use their pigment cells and they produce two different patterns on their body. The pattern which 
is directing to the female is uh, showing a male pattern, while the other body half is showing the pattern of a female. So the male who looks over thinks there are just two females hanging out together. Everybody's going to have to go on YouTube after this and just sit, find clips of that. It it's just amazing. It, it's beautiful. And they're so smart, the phyllopodes. I love them. And um, tell us about, a little bit about the journey of the sea turtles. Yeah, that, that is really, really interesting. I mean, my next book is about sea turtles, really. And uh, because I just love these animals so much. And, you know, we have like seven species of sea turtles in our world oceans, and all of them are listed as endangered. But what is very fascinating is not that they're around since the dinosaurs age, is also their journey. Not much is known about their journey. You know, you know, the females, maybe you know that the females always come back to the beaches where they are born to lay their eggs. And the rest of their lives they spend in the open sea. So when a, when a baby turtle hatches, it will just run straight to the ocean and swim for a long time. And then they disappeared for years. And this is referred to as a lost years. Most of these lost years of the journey of sea turtles is known about the population in Florida of loggerhead sea turtles. So what they do when they're on the ocean, the sea turtles, the baby turtles just swim to the Sargasso Sea in the North Pacific, and they drift with the seaweed there, with the, with the algae there for years. And after that, they just, um, you know, they drift towards the Azores, and from there they head back to the Caribbean, where they spend the next 20 to 30 years. And the scientists were so baffled because how do they navigate around the ocean? How do they find their way back? And just recently, there are just um, some papers out and they say that, that uh, they use the uh, um, Earth's magnetic field. It's like birds. So they can recognize geographical latitude and longitude and because every region has their own patterns. And that's how they navigate around the oceans. It's just amazing. That is so incredible. Goodness me. And another thing that's really captured the public's imagination many, many years ago in a bad way with the film Jaws. Tell us why that's done such a disservice to sharks. If you have a look uh, how many fatal attacks we have per year, in 2020 it was 10 shark attacks worldwide. Worldwide, it's nothing and humans kill 100 million sharks per year. That's more than 11,400 per hour. That's our conservative estimates, right? And, and, and it's often what they call bycatch, isn't it? Yes. It's not deliberate hunting of the sharks, although that does happen in um, parts of Japan and China. You're not just there. Like Spain is one of the biggest shark catching uh, nations in the world. But sharks are so important for our ecosystem, aren't they? So if we're removing the top predator, what happens to the layer below? They are actually like the police in the ocean. They keep a healthy balance between populations. And they're so, so important. But, you know, just have a look at, at, the, at the coral reefs. You know, we have lots of grazing fish there. Sharks are very important for the oceans. And if you take them away, other populations of fish, you know, grow out of hands. Happened, I think it was in somewhere in America, California, I think. So there was a big mussel industry. And, but they have taken out um, the big sharks who would hunt cow nose rays. These rays eat mussels. So these populations of rays um, that went into the millions, I guess, they were just absolutely rays everywhere, which ate the entire mussel industry there. So that is really, you know, that affects us already. And we can, we can see that. Well, there's an argument for bringing back wolves in the UK yeah. in wild areas, so to control the deer, because the deer, as cute as they are, um, can really decimate woodlands. And so everything just gets out of balance. We kind of need that top predator, don't we? Absolutely. If you're feeling vulnerable or worried for your day, you know she interviews the best from Santa Fe to Dungeness, from mental health to happiness. Tree Lady talks to you today. Um, one of the things that really fascinates me also is the deepest oceans. It's like another world. What are black smokers and, and who can live down there? And what do they look like? 
That's very fascinating because that deep down we have the deepest uh, point on Earth is the Mariana Trench. It's like uh, 36,000 feet deep. It's actually deeper than the Mount Everest high is, right? It's very cold there. I have high pressure. It's quite hostile environment there, you would think, right? But it, it isn't. There are parts in the ocean which are like the oasis in the deep. And these oases are these, there's so much life there which accumulates around um, some hydrothermal vents. They are called, for example, black and white smokers. What are these black and white smokers? So actually these hydrothermal vents you can usually find in the mid-ocean ridges. So these are volcanically active mountain chains in the deep sea. So you have a lot of hot water there, right? And in these regions, minerals in the hot water are released and precipitate in the cold water, so very cold waters, and then they form vents. And this superheated water um, actually pre precipitates minerals. These adds to the stacks of, uh, of minerals and they can get quite high and then they look like chimneys. And around these chimneys, because the water there is so nice and warm, marine life can accumulate. And uh, you can find different animals there. You can, uh, you can find like crabs and clams and, you know, it, it's just beautiful. And people who have been there, which are not many, were so astonished to see in these deep, cold and hostile environments, you know, this, so much life. And yet the pressures are so intense and it's really, really dark. Yes. So how do they find their way around? Because some have bioluminescence and, and ways of <laughs> using like a head torch, like the anglerfish. Fish underwater are able to, you know, produce their own light. Um, it's, a, it's a cold light. And they usually do this to attract mates or prey. And this is very, very useful down there. But sadly, I read in the book that our addiction to technology, to the latest mobile phone, is actually threatening the deep sea. Yes, it is. Uh, because, um, you know, our phones don't have a long lifespan anymore, like all technologies right now. They are built to break after a couple of years. And, of course, having the newest smartphone is an it piece. You know, it's a must-have. Uh, so we need a lot, I mean, for, for these technologies like smartphones, um, e electric cars, for example, solar panels, we need raw materials. And lots of them we can find deep down in the ocean. They are hidden in the depths. And, you know, it started a real gold rush in the deep. So what the industry nations are trying to do is they're trying to get these um, materials out of the water. So you can find these rare and quite valuable materials in um, some things that are called nodules. They look like big potatoes on the seafloor, really. They just grow a little bit slower than potatoes. They actually, I think, they grow like 0.2 to 0.5 inches every million of years. Oh my goodness, so once they're gone, they've gone for millions of years. They are gone for millions of years, yes. Well, but the entire machinery actually sucks up the ocean floor and the nodules and sucks up everything. And of course, there are animals living there. And, you know, you destroy entire habitats there for millions of years or thousands of years, sorry. It's a giant sucking machine, indiscriminately sucking up the ecosystem and then it's lost. Yes, exactly. And we are encouraged in the UK to have an electric car. <laughs> yeah. And I'm guessing that the batteries for that electric car may in some part come from the deep sea of ecosystem. In the future, yeah, likely. Moving on back to the animals, um, really they have quite crazy sex lives and, and some of it's quite <laughs> unpleasant really i mean there's a really sinister side to the cute company sea otters oh yeah they look fluffy and so cute with their button eyes and fluffy fur but at least the males have a very very dark side actually um you know they they made really rough 
first of all, you know, they have very uh, slippery fur because their fur is so dense. So they're made face to face. And because they slide off the females, they have to bite their noses, bite their fur, and some females can lose their nose. But that's not all, actually. And <laughs> there are males who don't have harem where they can steam off, right, and reproduce. Um, so when they don't have a harem, they look for quite helpless victims in the ocean, like the adorable seal cubs, for example, and they force them to copulate and they drown them quite often. And then they continue copulating with a dead, decaying corpse. So that's quite disgusting. Oh, my goodness. And the cute little <laughs> Adele penguins as well, much beloved by children's programs. Yes, Similarly, the males are very keen, aren't they? Well, at least those who don't have a mate, yes, you know, in Antarctica, they they meet uh, every year, every summer, thousands of them, and, you know, most of them have a mate, they meet every year, but some of them don't. So the bachelors live at the edge of the population, and um, when they build their nests, they do it with pebbles in the Antarctic. And these are quite valuable down there. There are just so many pebbles, right? Some females do steal them from other nests, but that causes a lot of trouble. So what they do is the females waddle to the edge of the colony where the bachelor males are. And these the males are quite smart. So what they did is they accumulated um, lots of pebbles and the females know that. So what the females are doing is they waddle there they actually offer sex in exchange of a pebble. So it's prostitution yes. down there. <laughs> and then they waddle back to their waiting, you know, partner, which is really funny. All innocence. <gasps> Goodness me. And whilst, whilst we're on the subject of sex, I mean, let's talk about penis size. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, That's amazing. It is. Yeah. Well, you know, it's not just amazing for us, but also Charles Darwin was completely, completely absorbed by it you know is one of his favorite topic were acorn barnacles and their length of their penises because actually these tiny barnacles have the greatest body penis size length ratio in the animal world their penis is eight times the length of their body which is absolutely oh, amazing goodness me and also is it the flatworms that have penis fights so what would these flatworms do? They are hermaphrodites. They have two penises. They fight for the right to inseminate the other worm because that, you know, being in, uh, you know being the female part takes a lot of energy, you know, producing the egg and so on, while the male can just you know slither away. So the winner can inseminate then the others, the the, the female part. Oh, I was also talking of um, penises and, and reproduction. There was a story about a lady who had a squid who didn't cook it long enough. 2008, there was a Korean woman who cooked uh, not long enough uh, a squid. And squid reproduce um, actually with spermatophores. They are uh, capsules filled with sperm, basically, right? So she didn't cook the squid long enough. And um, when, it, when she had the first bite of her squid, she suddenly felt a sharp pain in her mouth and her, in her tongue. And it would just wouldn't go away. So she consulted a doctor. <laughs> and what he found was like a tiny, you know, spindle-shaped organisms who dug themselves into the tongue and her gums. And she got inseminated in her mouth by a squid. So you sh that's why you should cook them oh, thoroughly. Oh, dear. Oh, my goodness me. Going back to our earlier conversation about plastic, we know it's a massive problem, but tell us about microplastics. How does it cause harm? Well, you know, um, scientists uh, actually um, differentiate between primary and secondary microplastics. So we have primary microplastic, which is been produced as tiny pellets or being put in our cosmetics. And um, secondary microplastic is um, produced by degradation, like a plastic bag and the water degrades and, you know, into small particles. And the problem is with plastic itself, it contains harmful substances, which can cause cancer and other problems, health problems within the animal and also animal kingdom and also within us and also it accumulates um, the harmful substances like insecticides 
other harmful substances in, in nature. And when animals digest this microplastic, these harmful substances get released into the body. And this microplastic can break down into so small parts that it can venture through cells. And that's why you can find a lot of microplastic and, you know, and, and body and in the body in the flesh of lots of animals also in other humans and us humans because there are a new study where they found in the lung and uh, liver and uh, kidney tissue of humans microplastic so it is a huge huge problem because you can't filter it out our sewage system is not built to filter out such small particles and also another thing is when you wash your clothes consisting of fibers made of made of um, oil you can't um, uh, so the tiny fibers can't get filtered by um, the sewage plant when you wash your clothes uh, you know it will release lots of microfibers especially when you have polyester um, like sports clothes or fleas or something and a sewage plant can't filter these tiny microfibers so they will get released into our waters again um, which will be eaten then by animals so it will just wander up the entire it will just wander up the entire ecosystem they are eaten by tiny planktonic animals these animals are eaten by fish fish are animals by are eaten by sharks or us and that's how we also ingest a lot of microplastic uh, with our uh, daily food intake and we don't yet know enough about the effect that's going to have on the human race because plastics haven't been around that long in terms of evolution is it going to change our evolution is it just going to lead to greater disease is it going to shorten life expectancy? We don't know, do we? So new research points out that actually we will have probably shorter life expectancies because, you know, it's shown that you can get cancer by if you are in contact with too much plastic and, and the, the harmful substances. Children have uh, problems to develop language, for example, properly. Um, they have the general problems to develop properly and we have found all you know scientists have also already found uh, like an uh, embryo you know a not born human being yet substances you know from the plastic because the mother has been in contact with plastic too much Good so it is harmful i mean that really must be everybody i'm sitting here thinking oh I'm, i don't use much plastic touching my plastic ikea desk looking yeah. at my plastic well, keyboard it's everywhere i mean it's it's not you know it's actually it's a great invention i don't say it's a bad invention it is great just look at the, our industries our technology uh medicine it is great but you know this material which is which has a worth has become just trash because we use so much single use plastic and also another problem is we inhale it in our daily lives no matter where we are because like um, the car tires um, produce a lot of microplastic and with a fallout you know it, no this microplastic goes into the atmosphere and that's what we breathe Frauke, last night I watched that program on Netflix I can't pronounce so you mean Seaspiracy I do thank you very much <laughs> Well, I, I almost watched it. I, I couldn't see the end. It was just so distressing. But without wishing to go into it too deeply, I mean, do you think that commercial overfishing is contributing, number one, to plastic waste, and number two, to depletion of fish stocks? 100% both, yes. It is, uh, you know, it contributes to plastic pollution by discarding fishing nets they're called ghost nets and they are a huge threat to marine life myself i have uh, already rescued so many sea turtles from these nets but lots of them didn't make it that was just heartbreaking yeah and the other thing is of course um you know overfishing almost like 90 percent of global marine fish stocks are now fully exploited or overfished the use of the nets right they are highly destructive to marine environments you know just talking about these trawlers in the deep sea when they yes. trawl for bot fish living uh, near the bottom uh, so they destroy entire ecosystem there which 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 can't uh, you know which won't regrow for many decades it's so sad and, and what they call the bycatch all the other creatures that 
we don't eat just die and get chucked over you know just uh having a look at, at at the soul in the north sea according to greenpeace for every pound of soul caught in the north sea there's six pounds of bycatch that can be everything you know i mean bycatch you get everywhere you have dolphins you have seabirds you have sharks you have so many different animals which will be then discarded uh and and they are lost forever i naively thought that the dolphin friendly symbol on a tin of tuna meant that they only caught tuna and that's in question there is a story to be told so fish farms so i thought to myself because i i knew something about this when i go shopping i thought well i'll get something from a fish farm now that's not straightforward is it because it's not quite what you think it is well unfortunately not i mean fish farms are just fish who live on a tiny space in, in the sea in, in cages and they're highly stressed these animals it's uh, it's horrendous living conditions for them they get really really sick they get parasites and because they're getting sick they need to get fed medication and this will distribute in the oceans which is bad itself right yes because it's not healthy it's a bit like factory hens isn't it yes it is it's the same analogy they have no natural life always a pig or with the pigs yes and the disease is obviously spreading really quickly and the sea lice and everything is, is really harming them and so they're treated with lots of antibiotics and other chemicals and the waste the, the, the waste from their fish farms just spreads out and out and out into the sea. Yes. So that's a no for me personally. Yes, it is a no. It's a big no. You can have a look if they are fully organic. So this is a fish probably I would eat. I stopped really eating fish. I eat fish like once or twice a year. I really love eating fish. But, you know, I live in land and here I really don't want to buy any fish. If I'm on holiday somewhere by the ocean, I do eat fish. I love sushi. I have stopped eating sushi. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love sushi as well. And I've stopped eating it because I thought, where does this salmon come from? But uh, no. But we've talked about the wonder of the ocean and we've talked about the problems, the big problems of the ocean. But. We spoke at the beginning before we went recording that we have to have hope. Yes. You know, we have to have that positive energy. And your book, The Blue Wonder, which I highly recommend, is full of the beauty and full of hope. But what messages of hope and practical action can you give to our listeners? Well, I've seen the last couple of years, you know, years back, I started talking about plastic pollution and microplastic and people really couldn't pronounce microplastic. They didn't know what it was. Now I go into schools and primary schools and kindergartens and tiny children know what I'm talking about. And this gives me so much hope because there is change in the society. There is awareness and people really trying are trying to make a difference. You can now shop plastic free uh, in a lot of places and um, people are aware of, of their daily, of the impacts of their daily choices. And this gives me a lot of hope really. And you know, it, it keeps me going. It's the same in all of us in the environmental world. You have to have hope. You can see there is a shift in society's attitudes and um, there's enough goodwill Finally, Frank, what is your dream scenario? My dream is actually that politicians wake up and do more about climate change because we just have one world. And, you know, what we do right now is we're destroying our world, the only world we have. My dream scenario is that more people are more aware of the impacts of climate change because every single one of us, we have a choice we can make a difference. Absolutely wonderful. What a privilege to interview you. Listeners, get a copy of The Blue Wonder. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, Sharon. Have a good <coughs> evening yourself. And enjoy the time with your new puppy. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. <coughs> Bye. <laughs> Hit the subscribe button to guarantee you don't miss an episode and you can follow us on 
Twitter at the Tree Lady 67. Instagram, Tree Lady Talks. Facebook, Sharon Hosegood Associates. Or send an email to noel at treeladytalks.co.uk. <laughs> you know, there were bits in there where I felt like a 12 year old at an anatomy lesson. Yeah. There were, really. I don't. <laughs> I've got to have it. It's a serious thing, though. It's so serious. And it's just a reminder, this podcast series is called Tree Lady Talks. But as we've said throughout the series, every single thing in this world, this beautiful planet of ours, is linked together. And speaking to Frauke, who's such a fantastic advocate for everything blue, and such a warm and engaging person just shows you that what happens in the deepest deep ocean is impacting and in the UK the Met Office said climate change has started. It certainly has and I tell you what I I do actually know what I want to do in the future though. What's that? I want to be a marine biologist and the reason I want to be a marine biologist is not only to help the fish but I want to go to Germany, Egypt, Vienna, Paris, UK, Maldives, the North Atlantic garbage patch and finally of course Southampton. Oh yeah, such a great city. So there we are. That's, I mean, what a fantastic, fantastic episode that was. Well, we really enjoyed doing that, I must say. I mean, I'm not belittling what was going on at all. I thought it was fabulous what was what was being explained. Uh, it's just that I've never heard the word beginning with P in a true lady talk before. And so there well, we are. There you are. It's really important to understand the, the functions of what goes on in the ocean. I know, I, I know. I nearly said down below. No, I know. We've had enough of that already. Oh, no. But really, the important point here is, it's changed the way that I live my life here in that podcast. And I think it's so, so important to think about every decision we make. The fact that magnesium comes from the deep sea and what it's used for. So if you want to find out more, please read the book. It's entertaining, really easy to read, but really packs a punch where we need to hear it. Yeah, all the information is on the treeladytalks.co.uk website. And we have some news about the future, don't we, Sharon? Well, this episode has really shown us just how much we love doing the podcast, but we're so busy with our business and other roles that we have. And we have a new puppy um, that we can't really carry on without sponsorship. And I now understand when I listen to my favourite podcast, we couldn't do this podcast without sponsorship. So we're going to be exploring what we're going to be doing in the future. But in the meantime, there is a fantastic back catalogue of episodes from people all around the globe covering everything from really detailed tree health to global environmental issues, how we can improve our mental health, how we can build cities starting from green issues upwards. Everything is there. So please look back, treeladytalks.co.uk. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Contact Noel, N-O-E-L, at treeladytalks.co.uk. Well, I think... Now we'd have to use a big triangle. Yes, yeah, a massive. I tell you one. what. No, actually, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll get a. I'll get a massive, great church bell, and I think I'm going to give that a donk. How about that? Sounds good. That's all for me. So say good night, Sean. Good night, folks. Thank you so much for listening and for all the support and the huge download numbers we've had.